Deep waiting. This was a useful technique used by both sides during World War II. Deep waiting gear, which took several shapes during the war, allowed a tank to drive partially or completely underwater on the sea floor. Deep waiting gear was essentially a snorkel system. Tall ducts extending from the engine rose above the turret, allowing for the engine to breathe underwater. Along with the ductwork, waterproofing many areas of the tank was essential. The mantle, turret ring, and gun, for example, all needed waterproofing. World War II era tanks were sensitive to water, and waterproofing was a lengthy process, which further required consideration for quickly removing waterproofing material. For example, small explosives had to be placed on tanks to clear waterproofing which might obstruct operation on exit from the water. This way a tank could immediately engage in battle. Ductwork was either released by a cable system or bashed off by rotating the turret. Nice ride you got here, Nick. Great to be in top beach. We should put them to work before they're missed. Deep wading designs saw use in many amphibious operations. Churchill tanks in 1942 during the Dieppe raid advanced up to the beaches aided by deep wading modifications. Churchill's used the distinct Y-shaped pipes on the rear decking. The raid was a disaster, but of no fault of the technology. Deep wading tanks used on D-Day had greater success. They gave landing craft more safe options for dropping off their tanks away from obstacles. Wading modifications were used on many Allied vehicles of all types during D-Day and throughout the war. Thousands of pounds of asbestos paste and other waterproofing compounds were smeared over electrical systems of hundreds of vehicles to make them ready to be landed in Europe. Waterproofing was also done using fabric that was similar to what balloons were constructed with. Some vehicles took the approach of waterproofing by means of building up their entire hulls with steel panels. Vehicles used for wading were typically new, as they needed reliable seals and welds. Even with all the modifications, just after one wade through seawater, all of these vehicles were deemed to have reduced their life expectancy by half. What's the matter? Can't you get your finger out? What's the matter, lad? Engine work starts, sir. For a seawater, I think. Deep wading was a nervous experience for tank drivers. They could hit a patch of soft sand and get stuck, or a deep spot in a river and become completely submerged, and forced to press on blind or attempt to escape the vehicle. The most terrifying deep wading vehicle to operate was no doubt the Tauchpanzers, or U-Panzers. These are modified Panzer IIs, threes, and fours with a completely waterproof hull. These tanks could operate submerged up to 15 meters with their air supplied by an 18 meter long rubber hose. They would communicate with a barge via a cable, which along with a gyro compass, helped them navigate in the depths. Driving these tanks underwater was a nightmare. If they hit rocks or stopped for any reason, they had a hard time going again, and the crew would have to attempt to escape or be towed out. 254 tanks in total were converted for amphibious use, and the possible invasion of the United Kingdom, which never came. The Germans further developed more conventional snorkels for their larger tanks, which often weighed too much to cross bridges, forcing them to ford rivers, while other vehicles crossed the bridges above them. <laughs> Dedicated amphibious vehicles like LVTs used in the Pacific were used in limited numbers during D-Day. They were given less priority in Europe, with US Army doctrine favoring DD and wading Shermans to take on the more heavily defended beaches in Europe. LVTs were decent amphibious vehicles and performed well in the Pacific, but were too thinly armored in the European theater. Their tracks also didn't do well on hard ground, so they were better suited to soft sand versus European roads. Today, wading remains still a popular option for many tank designs, with the greatest improvement being that the crew hatch is now part of the system. So should the vehicle become bogged down or sink, the crew has an escape route. Alright, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching this video on deep wading. Stay dry, and also maybe avoid the asbestos paste. Take care, and we'll see you in the next one.